Welcome to another webinar sponsored by 160 Marina Bay, Fort Lauderdale's newest and most ultra luxurious boutique condo building. Today's webinar is a very, very popular topic, moving to Florida, mind your taxes. Today we have with us the one and only um, Ken Rios from Tax Principal at Kaufman Rawson and Teague Lawrence, a practicing tax attorney and co-developer of 160 Marina Bay. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate, by the way, uh, the backgrounds, the virtual background showing our project. It looks beautiful. Thanks, Jordan. My pleasure. So thanks for being here. This is a really popular topic. A lot of people want to hear about taxes and your tax savings uh, for both individuals and companies moving to Florida. Uh, before we do so, as the sponsor of today's webinar, uh, I want to give a brief rundown of 160 Marina Bay. Let me get some visuals up here on my screen. So 160 Marina Bay, we are a brand new condominium project located right off of Las Olas Boulevard in the heart of Fort Lauderdale. We are a 16 unit boutique building. These units were really designed to feel more like a home as opposed to a condo unit. We have two different models, almost 3000 square feet. We're a five level building, floors two through five are the residences. That's four units per floor and eight units per elevator. So it's a very private residence and we're located right on the water so you can get your own boat slip. Fort Lauderdale is the largest city in Broward County, and it's situated directly in the middle of the Tri-County Southeast Florida area. So we have Miami about 25, 30 minutes to the south, and West Palm Beach and Palm Beach to the north about another 25, 30 minutes. Our project's located 1.4 miles directly to the heart of Fort Lauderdale Beach. Fort Lauderdale does have some of the nicest beaches in Southeast Florida. I believe there's around 24 miles of coastline just in the Broward County, Fort Lauderdale area. For those of you who don't know, we do have a lot of out of staters attending today. Fort Lauderdale is known as the yacht capital of the world. There are more registered yachts in Fort Lauderdale than any other city in the world. It's also called the Venice of Americas. We have a ton of waterways, canals, intracoastal, where restaurants and shopping are lined up along the water. It's really perfect for uh, any boater to take their boat around. It connects right to the downtown. You can go to the art museum and everything on Las Olas in the heart of the downtown city uh, with your boat. A brief overview of the location of our project. We're located directly on Isle of Venice Drive, uh, which is one of the finger islands in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Las Olas Boulevard is the main drag in Fort Lauderdale. So we are a perfect project for anybody thinking about or that can't decide between beach living and downtown city living. We're the perfect blend of both. We're right in between. We're 1.4 miles to the heart of Fort Lauderdale Beach to the east and to the west. We're about 0.9 miles to everything in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Here you have all your art museums, your restaurants, your bars, your shopping. So in both directions, you have everything at your right at your control. We're also located at the far end of Isle of Venice Drive. This is very important because it's less traffic and more private. It's also very easy to take your boat from your backyard all throughout the intracoastal and you can be out to the deep sea ocean in about 25 to 30 minutes. We're also facing east. We have really large terraces on our project. So we, the developer didn't wanna put west facing balconies where you get beat by that hot sun. So facing east, you can enjoy your terrace at all hours of the day. You're also overlooking the single family home mansions of Fiesta Way and the other aisles to your east. Geographically, we are right in between Miami and Palm Beach. Again, we are, um, it's about a 25 to 30 minute drive to Miami or we're eight minutes from the Brightline station. This is a brand new high speed luxury train that connects Miami, Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach all within 25 minute stops. The fourth stop is eventually going to be Orlando. So from Fort Lauderdale to Orlando, it will be about two and a half hours. Uh, Brightline opened up about two and a half years ago. It shut down for COVID right now, but they will be opening by the end of the year. This is another great feature, especially for those moving from the Northeast where you're used to mass transit. The Brightline is a really great thing. Uh, our amenities are gonna have, we're gonna have a beautiful waterfront pool, lounge chairs, cabanas, and a barbecue area along the marina. And these will be the most high tech units um, around from about five control panels uh, on the wall. You can control the lighting, the temperature, the window shades. You can even talk to your master bathroom shower head to tell it to turn on before you get into the shower. So very high tech units and they are ultra luxurious. We are importing our large porcelain tile floors direct from Italy. We're placing them all along the terrace as well. 
Uh, we are putting a wet bar in the dining area. All the cabinets in the apartment are directly imported from Italy. We're using matte black finishes for that more sophisticated feel. Fort Lauderdale is known as a very sophisticated city, so we're trying to make our product match up to it. This is a view from a second floor middle unit in our project. You can see what your view is going to look like as well. Really spacious units, almost 3,000 square feet. Our kitchens are beautiful. They are chef inspired U shaped kitchens. We have 10 foot islands, all the high end appliances. We have Wolf, Maley, and Sub Zero uh, for the refrigerator. We're using a beautiful quartz, uh, which is really durable. Hidden panel for the refrigerator and dishwasher and two tone cabinets. Even little things like linear diffusers and four inch hi hats. This is a very luxurious product. Our terraces are almost 11 feet deep. This is a view from a fourth floor corner unit. And our building is very modern in design, yet it still has the sophisticated and elegant feel that Fort Lauderdale deserves and a beautiful nighttime rendering. For more information on the product, on the project, you can go to 160marinabay.com. Our expected delivery is the second quarter of 2022. Our price is right now, they range from 2.2 to about 2.5 for the penthouse units. And again, go to 160marinabay.com for more information. Uh, it's a beautiful project. We're very proud to present it to all of you. But for now, let's get into it. Let's start talking to Ken and Teague and hear more about taxes and tax savings. It's a very popular topic now. Um, so gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, give me a second. I'm gonna be sharing my screen with a presentation for you. Um, here we go. So. You know, we're going to, Teague and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the tax benefits of living in Florida, you know, besides the weather, the beaches, and the beautiful uh, units at uh, Marina Bay that, that Jordan just went through. Uh, so with that in mind, we, we'll, we'll leave some time at the end for some questions, as some of you may have some questions, but uh, we'll start now with the presentations because we got a lot of content to go through. Sure. Ken, before you get started, I just want to chime in. Ken brought up a good point. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, for all the participants, if you do have questions, you can type them in there. And then just as Ken said, towards the end, we will try to answer some of them. Thank you. So today I'm speaking. I'm a transplant from New York. So I attended Fordham uh, uh, Graduate School of Business and Law School and lived up there for about 11 years. And uh, Teague is also with me, who's a tax attorney. Um, I don't know if T, you want to say something quick about yourself. Well, I, go ahead and take it away for now, and I'll chime in uh, when you're finished. Okay. So we're going to go over a little bit over some of the Florida individual tax benefits, what you necessarily need to do to establish residency, some of the, the pitfalls that the states have, uh, the states that you're leaving, so you're aware of some of the rules. Uh, we'll focus a little bit more on New York, since a lot of our attendees are from the Northeast and New York area. We'll talk a little bit about if you're moving your business or contemplating moving your business, what the Florida tax landscape is, some of the potentials, credits, and incentives. Then Teague will talk about some of the federal tax impacts of selling your uh, prior residence. And then we'll leave it some time for questions. So <clears throat> generally, as many of you are aware, Florida is one of the states that doesn't have a personal income tax. That means that also there's no capital gains tax. You know, you still have your federal taxes on your capital gains that, you know, what Biden is going to be increasing, but for state purposes, there isn't a capital gains tax. There's no estate or inheritance state tax in the state. Uh, Florida has one of the lower sales tax rates, the state rate 6%. Uh, there's discretionary sales tax in uh, Broward County of, of 1%, but that generally up to the first 5,000 uh, uh, of cost of whatever you're purchasing, but it's still lower than California, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. Our, our real property taxes in the state on average are, are lower than most states. You know, we're lower than Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And also, you know, there's a homestead exemption available that would reduce the value, the assessed value of your property for purposes of property tax. I uh, wanted to make, you know, for those in New York, or even if you're not, if you're not in New York, back last week, uh, Governor Cuomo signed a 2021 22 budget bill. So as you're aware, if you or if you're not aware, your your tax is going to be increased in New York. So if you're making more than 1.1 million dollars or married filing jointly and earning more than two million, 
your tax rate in New York is going from 8.82% to 9.65%. So that's another reason you may want to move down here because you're going to be taxed more. And for those uh, banking between five to 25 million and over 25 million, there's uh, two new tax brackets that were uh, proposed and, and passed, one going up to 10.30 and 1.10.90. And if you live in New York City, which they have a New York City resident tax, so now you're going to be paying between 13 and a half and 14.8% which is now surpasses California as the highest individual tax rate in the nation. Um, also for corporate franchise tax for the CT3, the, for corporations in New York, your tax also the rates increased about 0.75% from 6.5% to 7.25. So the more reason to consider moving to Florida and uh, moving your business as well. Uh, as you've seen in the news and what for, you know, there's a lot of people that moving over the, over the last year with COVID and with all the tax increases. Uh, so establishing residence, I just wanna point out some of the definitions um, on what a resident is, you know, for California purposes, you know, California looks to uh, a resident as being somebody who's, who's in California for more than a, a temporary or transitory purpose. So, you know, they typically deem, it's not necessarily 183 days, but if your intent is to be and make California your home, you're deemed a resident. The inverse is true if you're trying to move out. Uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, typically their, their definition of what a resident is, is that if it's an individual whose permanent resident or domicile is in that state, and they maintain that, that permanent place of abode and spend more than 183 days. New York's a little bit more robust. Uh, so New York considers a resident, you know, somebody that, that you know, has a domicile in New York and you can only really have one domicile under the law in New York. You can't have two domiciles. You can have properties outside of New York, but you know your permanent domicile is in New York, and they look to somebody that has a permanent place of abode there and spends 183 or 84 days in New York during the taxable years. There are some exceptions. An exception is an individual domicile in New York and treated as an non-resident if they maintain a permanent place in New York, but they're outside of New York to spend 30 days or less, okay? Um, so, so wait, there, Ken, let me just chime in yeah. for a second. These things become, these definitions become really important because uh, in the big picture, what's happening is, is you have this exodus of people from the Northeast that are moving into low tax jurisdictions and things like that. So the first thing that's happening is that the state legislatures are creating uh, uh, or increasing the taxes in various ways up there. And then on the back end, when people are moving out, they're initiating examinations for the people that are leaving to, you know, as people are saying, yes, I'm actually a resident of Florida or I'm a resident of elsewhere. They're basically saying, prove it. So one of the main things that we're trying to uh, uh, explain today is that when you do move to Florida and hopefully you buy one of these units, but when you do move to Florida, you really want to cross your T's and dot your I's and make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. Because if you do get audited by one of these states that's chasing revenue, then you just want to be able to withstand inspection. And so, so really, we're not trying to make you a tax expert today. We just want you to understand the issues. I'm sorry, King, go ahead. No, no, those are some good points you raised there, Teague. Uh, you know, New York has over 300 uh, auditors that, that look at you know, that audit uh, people that are moving from the state. So they have a pretty robust uh, group that looks into these things. And usually when you have, you're a high income earner and you move to Florida, that's kind of like a red flag that they look into. And when you're talking about domicile, you know, you know, that typically refers to the place you, know, you intend to be your permanent home. And uh, New York, for example, you cannot ac accomplish a change in domicile merely by purchasing a unit at 160 Marina Bay. You have to kind of dot your, your I's and cross your T's and do some more things. So for example, you know, if you combine the purchase of a home with other trappings of, of residency in a new state, like acquiring a driver's license or registering to vote, you know, those things help, but you know, your actions also speak volumes. Uh, so, you know, just getting, staying with New York, you know, New York looks at for generally general things in in seeing whether you're still a resident in New York, they look at your home, the location, whether you own or rent it, the use, the size, the value. So, for example, if you have a 
a $20 million home in New York, and then you buy this $2 million property in, in Florida and maintain that home, that $20 million home and visit it quite often, that's, that could be a, a prevailing factor. You know, not one factor by itself, it, it, it's gonna be, you know, uh, determinative, but it's really, the ser- you know, it, it's a case by case basis, but it's really, you're looking at your intent. So another thing they look at is your active business involvement. So if you're a executive at a business and you're still, uh, the business is still located in New York and you flying up all the time to tend to the business, you know, you're not, you know, it, it goes towards whether you're still, you know, it's a fact pattern that whether you're still uh, being have ties to New York. Uh, time spent, again, we talked about the 183 days in Florida. You know, if you're, if you're in, um, for example, California has a case that somebody moved to Nevada, they had a vacation home in Nevada, but they were still spending six months in California, two months in Nevada, and the other four months traveling for either vacation or business. And they, you know, they, they still had a lot of business ties to California and California ruled that they were still California residents and taxable in California because the preponderance of the evidence showed that their intent was for them to be, you know, that they weren't temporary in, in California. You know, they were temporary in Nevada because they spend much less time in Nevada. And um, if I could York- just add something to that. Sure. When, when the tax authorities come in, um, you know, th- there was there was a time in years past where, you know, people could uh, set up documentation, you know, you change your driver's license, um, establish a residence in Florida, do things that for all intents and purposes make you appear to be a full time Florida resident, when in fact, maybe you are spending significant time elsewhere. But with, uh, you know, today's society. The thing that you have to remember is everything you do now creates a digital footprint. If you go to the gym, if you uh, uh, fly, you travel, um, you you know go to the movie theater, you buy uh, uh, seats at the movie theater, you do it all online. Everything you do now uh, basically creates a digital footprint, and the tax authorities are searching uh, those digital footprints footprints. They know how to access that data. They know how to look at your social media. They know how to uh, delve into those areas that you may not even think of when you're uh, considering whether you're a a Florida person or a New York person, but they're they're looking at it. They're saying, well, hey, you know what? It's all well and good that you say you're in Florida, but you've been going to the gym in New York six days a week for the past six months. So these are the things that they're doing, the examiners. So you have to be conscious of uh, uh, what your situation really is. And, and again, you want to cross your T's, dot your I's, and uh, Ken, go back and. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, and if you got selected for audit by New York or in any other states, one of the initial things they ask for is your credit card, re- your credit card statements for the last uh, 36 months, as well as your cell phone uh, bills, because they're trying to determine. By, by by the transactions where you were uh, and, and determine what they so you know that's a good point that they brought up but they, you know New York one of the the four things they also look at is that where the items near and dear to you are so if you you know if you have a art collection that's worth millions of dollars and you keep it in New York and you don't move it to Florida then that you know goes to show your intent I mean New York is pretty onerous as you know as opposed to the other states all the states look at to these these rules, but New York is pretty onerous. And, and, and if you pass all the rule, you know, all the requirements in New York, you should be pretty good in any other states, regardless of what other state you're coming into. Because they really look at to, you know, your family connections as well. So for example, you know, one of the things they look at, and again, I, I want to reiterate that it, not one thing is, 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 is it's ex- exclusive. They look at a variety of things. So it's kind of forming the, the, the strength of your fact pattern to show that you're a Florida resident. Uh, but they look at, you know, one of the things if you have small uh, underage children is the schools that you, your children go to. So usually you move to an area because they have good schools or it has a, a school that's a close proximity to your home. So moving here, unless your kid's in a, a, a boarding school, you know, moving to Florida and, and having your kids go to school in Florida, it's, 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 a, it's a strong sense that you vacated New York and your intent was to permanently leave the state. So, 
you know, establishing residency in this, this slide and in the next slide is some of the steps that you could take to, to kind of ensure that you're dotting these I's and crossing the T's. So spending 183 days in Florida, selling your primary residence, which T will get into some of the uh, federal tax implications of that and purchasing, you know, your home in Florida, your primary home, file for a homestead exemption, um, which I'll talk a little bit in, in a minute. You know, changing your Florida driver's license, your government issued ID, registering to vote, registering your auto, the one that you're gonna keep at 160 Marina Bay and your car and your or plane. And, and, and Florida has a Florida a declaration of domicile you can file with the, the clerk, the circuit court, which is a form of kind of affidavit showing your intent, you know, when you move to Florida and you're made it, you're intended to be Florida to become your permanent resident. Um, you know, if you have a will or state planning documents that are governed by whatever state you're moving to, if you change that to Florida law, that helps your bank, moving your bank accounts and safety deposit boxes. And, and when you file your most recent federal income tax return, when you move, you want to use the Atlanta Service Center showing your Florida address and marking, you know, your New York, California, whatever as your final return, if possible. Because again, you want to change your address on your federal return. Yeah, yeah, on your federal return. And then, you know, any life insurance or insurance policy, you know, that change the address on those policies and, you know, and join country clubs down here and cancel those. I mean, those are things that typically we see in our experience help. Uh, but again, it's the intent mm -hmm. that you vacated the state and, and kind of severing ties. I mean, you can still maintain a, a home in, in your former state, but you gotta kind of look at all these things, you know, in totality and, and see whether it meets the, the, the burden. Because the burden is on you if you get selected for audit to prove all these things, okay? Uh, you know, again, make sure that your 160 Marina residence becomes your primary residence in any mortgage document, homeowner insurance policy. If you move and your employer doesn't change, notify HR. So, you know, I'm gonna get into New York. New York has a convenience or employer rule that is that has caught a lot of my clients because and if you're not aware of that rule, I'll go with that rule, but it's a, it's a pretty stringent rule. So you want your employer to change your records to show Florida being your home. Um, quickly, the Florida homestead exemption, some states have something similar. Uh, you know, for Florida legal purposes, once you become a Florida permanent resident, you qualify to get a Florida uh, homestead exemption. It's not that you know, it's not a big value, but it, you know, it reduces the mm -hmm. assessed value of your home by 50%. The application requires that you have a Florida driver's license or a state ID that reflects the property address and you can't lease it to somebody else. So, you know, one of the requirements is to, to make, to get this Florida homestead exemption is that the Florida home is your permanent residence. So if you get the Florida homestead exemption, it helps to prove, to prove that you your intent was to have this Florida resident in your permanent home. So that's a good fact, okay. you know. And just, uh, just to add to that, yeah. the, uh, the real value with the Florida homestead exemption is, is the, um, uh, it, it activates the save our homes value. So when you buy your residence in Florida and it becomes your principal uh, residence and you, and you file for the homestead exemption, the appreciation that you're taxed on, the value that you're taxed on is capped. Uh, and it's and you get a minimal year over year increase. Whereas if you don't put that exemption in place, then in theory, the value that you're taxed on for the resident should be the fair market value of the property. So you could have someone that's owned their home for 10 years where the actual value of their home is now say $10 million but they might be paying tax on a million and a half dollars of value. So there's a tremendous tax savings there uh, on, a, on a sort of a, uh, in perpetuity until you sell the house. Right, that's so correct. year over year, you can save a lot in property taxes. So you always want to get that in place right away. Go ahead, Ken. So, you know, with COVID, a lot of people have been moving and working remotely. Um, so generally, if you work in, in state X, you know, California or another state, whether you're a resident or not, you have to pay taxes on those wages you earned in that state. You know, it's a source rule. And the source of, of income from services is the location where you perform those services. So you could be a Florida resident you do, uh, getting doing a job in New York or in California, you're going to pay taxes on that income earned from 
providing those services or earning that income in that state. But with the rise of e-commerce, you know, and COVID and advanced technology, people are working from home more often than not. Uh, and most states are looking at where the employee's work is actually performed. So, you know, you don't have an issue in some states if you are working remotely, as long as you, you your intent is to permanently move to Florida. But, you know, so for example, a computer programmer residing in Florida and working from his home, you know, and they're an Apple employee in California would not earn California source income when he's working in Florida, uh, unless he's still a res deemed a resident of, of California. However, the same scenario for New York, you would still be taxed in New York if you're working in Florida because they have this convenience or employer rule, which is something you know that, that not many states have. There's only about five states that have a similar type rule. What the convenience or employer rule says is that New York is gonna continue to tax you as an employee of New York, if you're working remotely, unless you, you, your company has an office in Florida, establishes an office in Florida, or converts your home office into a bona fide office, which is very hard to do. So a lot of times what I tell uh, my clients is when you're moving your business or you're moving here and you're an executive, make sure your, your company is either establishing an office or renting one of these WeWork or uh, Regis type uh, temporary offices that they list as a office because then you could work out of there and it kind of you know beats or defeats this convenience of employer rule. Because if you move down here and you do all these things and you dot all the I's and T's but you're still employed by a New York company and you haven't established a bona fide office, your, your wages may still be taxable by New York even though you established residency in Florida. So you wanna make sure that if you're uh, you know, an executive that you've set up an office in Florida, rent a, 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 you know, if you don't have an actual lease for a commercial building, rent a, a temporary space in one of those WeWorks or establish the bona fide you know, office in your home. Um, so you know, the, this slide kind of goes into that and, and, and there's a, a memoranda by the Department of Taxation of Finance that kind of goes through this test and what do you need to do to make your home uh, office, a bona fide office, which is very hard to do because your employer has to reimburse you for the office expenses. They have to list that home office as, you know, on, on the phone book, which there is a phone book anymore because now everybody uses, but on the internet as a, as a location of the, uh, of the company. And there's a lot more things that need to be done. This, this be is one of those rules that'll sneak up and get you. Yeah. So be when, cognizant when, when of the those, auditor comes. You're going to oh, say, hey, I moved to Florida, and they're going to say, well, you know, that's fine, but, you know, here you are. Yeah, and another thing is, you know, I've had clients that, you know, have reported, you know, their wages to New York, but once New York taxes you, their definition of income includes your bonuses, mm -hmm. you know, it includes um, your CIP and whatnot, so, you know, your tax base could really go up and you'd be taxed, even though you're a Florida resident, you could be sucked back in and be taxed on your wages and bonuses in New York if your employer is in New York and you don't establish an office in Florida. These are some of the factors. And I don't know, uh, Jordan, I mean, if people reach out to us subsequently and want us to share this slide deck, we could probably provide that to them. Right, T? Actually, so we're also, Ken, we're going to be, uh, everybody who registered for the Zoom, we'll, we will be sending them a copy uh, of this recorded webinar. So the webinar is being recorded uh, actually, somebody asked that in the in the chat. So a copy of all this will be sent to everyone who registered. And again, I'll have my contact info and Teague's contact info because, you know, you want to talk to your tax advisors when you're moving here. If not, reach out to one of us and we'll be glad to mm -hmm. speak to you and, and help you. Um, yeah, just so, on that note, it's, it's so important. Um, I, I, my practice focuses on cleaning up messes. And, you know, one of the first things, one of the first questions I always ask the client is, is okay, you know, what did you tell your CPA? So if you, if you uh, are, are actively involved with your CPA and you're letting them know what you're doing and hopefully you have some of those communications by email or otherwise, um, you know, it becomes uh, proof in the future in the event that you're ever in a penalty situation that, hey, you know what? I, I, I explained my situation to my CPA uh, because under the federal rules, 
you're allowed to rely upon the advice of your paid tax professionals. So if you're giving them uh, an indication of whatever transaction you're entering into or whatever, and they, they have the details of that, and they don't either report it properly or uh, don't report it at all. Um, if you can prove that you explain, you know, whatever to them, X, Y, or Z about your transaction, then you should be able to get yourself out of a, uh, out of a penalty situation by virtue of having reasonable cause for the error. Uh, I'm sorry, Ken, go ahead. That's a, that's that's a good point, T. Um, so you have other tax considerations. So make sure you consult with your tax advisor, like T said, or you know, or your tax professionals. Uh, when you're moving from from New York or California, you have specific rules on stock options, restricted stock stock units. Uh, you know, you have like kind exchanges if you're selling a property and buying another investment property. But make sure you're aware. Like for example, in New York, they have an actual form. That kind of, if you have stock options and restrictive stock units, you got to report that because if you earn these options while you were employed in New York and you exercise them when you become a Florida resident, you're still going to have to pay some tax to New York based on, on, on the spread between when you, that option was given and you exercised it. Uh, so there's some, and there's a form that New York tracks this. So when you move they, they, your tax return, uh, your final tax return would have this schedule that shows you know the value of these 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 items and california has something similar as well um so i want to make you aware that you know some of these things that you you have earned while you're employed in in, in your state once you move they you may still have to pay some tax to new york or california or new jersey or whatever um so moving your business so <clears throat> You know, many of you may have a, a, a closely held business and you're thinking of moving to Florida and you, you know, as, as I spoke, if you keep your, your business in New York, that shows some ties, but also you'll be paying tax to New York on distributions, K-1s from, from that business. If that business is still housed and operating in New York, to the extent you want to consider moving your business to New York, you know, from a corporate income tax perspective, Florida has one of the lower rates of 4.458, I'll go back up to five and a half for 2022, but it also has a $50,000 reduction on the tax base. Uh, uh, so it's more favorable than New York, California, and some of the other states. For pass-throughs, again, there's no entity level income tax on partnerships, no entity level tax on S corporations, because again, uh, there's no personal income tax. Uh, there's no state level property tax assessed on the business. Uh, there is a tangible personal property tax on assets in the business, but there's also, if it's your assets are less than 25,000, then you get an exemption from that. Uh, there's no corporate franchise tax on capital stock, uh, no, no property tax on business inventories, no property tax on goods in transit. Uh, and again, you know, there's a lot of exemptions. If you're a manufacturer, there's no sales and use tax on goods manufactured. Mm -hmm. And the property, the equipment would be a, a purchase exempt. Raw materials are exempt. So there are some benefits if you're considering moving your business to Florida as well as, as yourself. Um, there's also, um, we, you know, Florida offers sales and use tax exemptions on, on a lot of different industries, electric, you know, specifically manufacturing, uh, aeronautics, you know, aircraft and whatnot. So you got to look at the benefits that you, that your business could obtain if you also moved your business to Florida. Uh, <clears throat> there are uh, potential credits and incentives that are available. Uh, I work closely with uh, with uh, Alliance uh, for Lauderdale Greater for Lauderdale uh, Alliance uh, in putting them in contact with businesses that are moving, and they could work with you to get some of these type of uh, credits and incentives. You know, there's job credits and incentives. So again, you know, if you're moving your business here and you're going to create jobs, there's benefits in, in, in obtaining and applying for these incentives and grants. It's it's a it's, it's a benefit for your business if you're considering to moving your business. And again, if you're if that's something that's in the works for you as you're moving here, you know, contact me and we could work on helping you get the proper credits and incentives. And I can put you in contact with the the county, you know, whichever county you decide to locate, they have a um, 
um, an incentives group and, uh, and and they're looking to attract businesses to move to Florida and work with them. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ken, on, on that note, uh, we did a webinar a few weeks ago with, um, uh, with the mayor of uh, uh, Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale and Mayor Quintalis. And, and I, I have to say, I was just blown away at how uh, business friendly he is. I mean, he, he really wants to see the growth of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Fort Lauderdale is exploding right now and, and they're looking uh, in every way possible to partner with businesses. So if you do have that, uh, uh, a business up north and you're thinking about relocating it, it's a very inviting climate. Um, I, again, with uh, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance, uh, that would be one resource to reach out to. Um, of course, you want to uh, talk with Ken or, or, or someone like Ken, uh, who's an expert in state and local that can really hone in and see what incentives are available uh, for your particular business and, and your particular industry. Uh, sorry, Ken, go ahead. And I don't want to limit the credits and attempts of incentives to Fort Lauderdale. I mean, Miami-Dade. Oh, uh, yeah, because much bigger, right. It has a lot of benefits. I know major... The, the mayor there has been doing a lot from tech, you know, for the tech uh, uh, industry. West Palm Beach has a lot. And again, as Jordan mentioned, living in 160 Marina Bay, you have access to the Bright Line and, and you can commute to your business in those in those locations quite easily. So, you know, you could be centrally located living in Fort Lauderdale and, 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 and work in these other counties. Yeah, the, the, the crazy thing is, is that the motto of Fort Lauderdale literally is life less taxing. That's their motto. So that's not coming from us. That's literally Fort, Moderd Fort Lauderdale's motto is life less taxing. So there's a, 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 a whole lot of reasons to, to move to Fort Lauderdale uh, and Florida for that matter. Uh, I'm sorry. And we've also been seeing that also like directly with our buyers, especially because some companies do move to Miami, but a lot of the employees prefer to live in Fort Lauderdale because it is more of a communal area. Or if your company moves to West Palm, Fort Lauderdale is also next door too. So being centrally located to both of those counties where in all three counties, companies are moving, uh, being right in the center has definitely helped us. Yeah. Right. So again, if you have any questions, you know, there's a lot of detail with regards to what the states look at when you're moving and establishing res residency and vacating your prior home. I went through some examples. We went through a list of items that, you know, that you should be doing and, and when you move here. But if you want some specific advice, again, contact your tax advisor. Or again, you could reach out to me or Teague and we'll be glad to speak with you and, and help you or make sure that you don't, you know, trip up and, 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 and create some issues for yourself. Uh, to, I'm going to hand it over to T to talk a little bit of the, the federal tax rules regarding selling your, your, your old residence when you're buying the, your new unit at 160 Marina Bay, but T, take it away. All right. Thanks. Um, you know, before, before I get into all that, I want to take a minute uh, first, on behalf of my partners and, and myself uh, for the 160 Marina Bay project, it, it, what a pleasure it is to have Ken come in and, and, and do this presentation for everyone. He is absolutely an expert in state and local taxation for Kaufman Rawson, and he is the guy to go to uh, if you're going to be moving down to Florida or you're considering moving a business it's, it's really uh, so important that you get the right people in play uh, so that you set everything up right when you do eventually um, make the move. So um, uh, before, before I get, uh, go into my section, I just, I just really, I wanna take a minute to talk about how this whole project got started because I, I've sort of been where probably a lot of you are right now. Uh, where I, I grew up in South Florida and uh, when I finished my tax program at UM, I was recruited to go out and work in LA. So I was working for Deloitte and Touche in Los Angeles for three years. And this is in like the late nineties. And I found myself uh, one day I wake up and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm commuting two hours a day uh, into from Santa Monica to downtown LA to a, a, a job that I, I, I really didn't love. And I knew that I wanted to get back to Florida and start up my own uh, tax practice. 
So I, I finally did it. I, I said, I'm going to Fort Lauderdale. I had already lived in Fort Lauderdale because I went to law school at Nova Southeastern. And uh, one of the first things I did is I, I was looking for a place to live. I find this great little property and it's 160 Isle of Venice, which is now the development site that you're looking at behind me. That is uh, 160 Isle of Venice. So it's an old Florida condominium, little two story job. I was like 30 years old at the time. I'm like, this place is amazing. So I, I, I move in and, you know, I, I had lived in uh, Los Angeles. I had worked in Manhattan. Uh, I've worked in Miami, West Palm Beach. I can tell you unequivocally that Fort Lauderdale is one of the greatest places to live and work uh, that I've ever seen. It, it, none of these other places even compare. It's, it's just like a quality of life. It's a convenience. Um, the, the great thing about this uh, property is that it's right there in the heart of Fort Lauderdale. It's, it's, it, it couldn't be better. It, it, you know, you, you, you leave the property, you go out to Las Olas Boulevard, you hang a left and you're at the beach in two minutes. You hang a right, you're in downtown Fort Lauderdale in three minutes. And... <clears throat> It's something that when you, uh, you really have to live there to understand just how great this location is. So when you think about this project, there's really three things to think about. It's the location, the luxury, the product that we've put together. And then more importantly, it's your lifestyle. Because out of all the places I've lived, without question, the lifestyle in Fort Lauderdale is it, it's the most convenient, it's the most enjoyable. There's so much there in this little area uh, called Las Olas Boulevard, whether it's you, you like the, the restaurants, you like the nightlife, or you're serious and you need to work in downtown, or you love the beach, or you love boating. It's the boating capital of the world. Uh, it, it's just a unique place. And I think they refer to it as um, uh, the Venice of, of, of the United States. So uh, anyway, um, I wanted to, you know, to take it a step further, even within the island that you're on, this little island called the Isle of Venice, the location of our building is all the way down at the north side of the island. And what that means is it's a completely different atmosphere than the south side of the island. When you go to the north side of the island, it's just, you get out of your car, you're in the heart of Fort Lauderdale, yet you get out of your car and all you hear is the wind blow. It, it, it's, it, it's peaceful, it's tranquil. And what we've done with our building, which is also unique, is uh, we've tried to be the most technologically advanced building uh, that you can make right now. I, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody uh, with the type of capability uh, that we're putting into our building. Everything is tip top. We've scrutinized every detail. We hired the best architect. We hired the best designers. We're using great materials. We're using great appliances. And this, this is truly a place where you can be completely plugged in or completely unplugged. It's your choice. And then at the end of the day, when you've, uh, you know, done your three minute commute from downtown Fort Lauderdale back to your place, you can hop in your boat and go grab a beer at any number of restaurants that have pull up dockage or, or whatever. It's just a unique place to live. So I can't stress to you enough, uh, you know, if you're looking for a change, uh, it's really gonna be hard to match what you get here. Uh, with that, I'm gonna get back on point, you know, uh, the, the, well, one more thing, private elevators, private marina, private boat slips, it's all great, it's all well and good to have a boat, but the reality of it is in Florida, if it's not convenient to use your boat, you're not gonna do it. And so, you know, we've tried to get it all. You've got everything in this one package. Uh, anyway, so, now you've made the decision to buy one of our units, and, and I'm really happy about that. 
but uh, you're now you're selling your, your your other house up in the Northeast or whatever it is. So what is your what 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 is your tax situation? It's one of my favorite code sections in the entire in, in the entire Internal Revenue Code, which is, you know, about a mile thick and 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 the regulations are about a mile wide. But Code Section 121 is uh, it's it's one of my favorite code sections it's it's literally one of the last surviving uh tax shelters and and the reason that it is is that uh the code section basically says that a, a, a if if you've used your principal residence for two out of the prior if you've owned your principal residence for two years and you've lived there for two out of the prior five years, you can exclude up to 250,000 of the gain that you uh, attributable to that unit when you sell it or that, that residence when you sell it. And that number doubles for a married couple. So you're talking about excluding $500,000 of gain uh, on the sale of your principal residence. So uh, if you meet the test, and, and again, the test is, it's an ownership test and it's a use test. So it must have, you, you must have owned it for at least two years and it must have been your principal residence uh, for two of the prior five years. And those years do not have to be consecutive years. So in other words, if you owned your, 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 your residence for five years and uh, two, in year one, you live there in year uh, three through, or two through, th two through four, you live somewhere else. And then in year five, uh, you, you know, you, you, you lived, uh, you moved back to this place. So two out of the prior five years, you meet the test. Okay. Um, the, the only, the only caveat would be, uh, Ken, if you could go to the next slide, please. Is, um, uh, actually go to the next slide, Ken. The 121 has a, a, a limitation on it and that is for uh, a non-qualified use. So if you owned the house, uh, let's say you bought it in year one, you live there in year one and two, and then you rented it for three years, then you have a, a non-qualified use for the period of time that you rented it, and there would be a ratio that's applied. And it, basically how it works is you would, uh, you, you would say, okay, for three of the five years, uh, it was a rental property. So you take the three and you divide it by five and you come up with the uh, period of non-qualified use. And then you multiply that number by the gain that you have on the sale. And that'll determine how much of the 250 you can claim uh, by way of code section 121. And that, again, if you're married, it goes up to 500. So even though you have a non-qualified use, it doesn't prohibit it. It doesn't prohibit you from uh, using Code Section 121, but it does apply uh, a ratio that may limit the amount of gain that's eligible for exclusion under Code Section 121. And the other thing that you would want to keep in mind uh, when you talk about, you know, the sale of your principal residence. It's, it's the type of gain that you have. Uh, I'm sorry, Ken, back up a slide. I got a little bit out of order here. Uh, back up one more, please. Okay, so if you only own the residence for less than a year, then you basically have short-term capital gain. Short-term capital gain is gonna be taxed at your ordinary income rates. Once your holding period of the residence is greater than a year, you're gonna have long-term capital gain. But then of course, uh, when you get into the two-year scenario, then you start talking about the application of Code Section 121 that would give you the additional exclusion uh, of 250 if you're single or 500 if you're married. And then uh, you also want to make sure that you take into account basis adjustments. Uh, Ken, if you could go forward on the slide. Uh, you know, if you yeah. sell quickly before Biden's tax plan takes effect, you still get a lower capital gains rate, <laughs> right? So when you when you when you look at the um, uh, when you're calculating the gain on your sale, 
you want to make sure that over the years that you own the house that you go back and you create a spreadsheet which adds up all of the improvements, the cost of all the different improvements that you made to the house. By, because if you paid a million dollars for the house and you have 500,000 of improvements, your basis in the house is not a million, it's a million five. And then that becomes your baseline for purposes of calculating your gain. So when you go to sell, it, let's say you paid a million for the house, you have 500,000 of improvements and then you sell it for 2 million, um, your, your, your gain is not a million, it's only 500,000. So it's your purchase price plus your improvements. And, uh, and then you, you, know, you, you back that out from your sale price. And then of course you look to code section 121 to see if you meet the requirements there. And uh, again, always keep your CPA uh, advised of what you're doing. Uh, I, a lot of the a lot of the time uh, when when new clients come to see me, uh, I clean up messes. That's that's my specialty. Whether it's um, uh, domestic or international, non-compliant foreign accounts or or otherwise, uh, you know, the first question is always, okay, so who prepared your tax return and what did they know about your situation? Those are the those are the two primary questions that I ask in almost every new client that comes into my office. And uh, those answers really go a long way into determining the outcome of my client's cases. Because if I have someone that, you know, explained what they were doing to their CPA and it's pretty well documented and uh, there's a paper trail or, or, or there's uh, uh, notes of a conversation or otherwise, it puts my client in a much stronger position for dealing with uh, potential penalties or other situations that may arise. So always, always, always tell your CPA, you know, what you're doing, what your plans are. And uh, if you're moving to Florida, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to open it up to, for, for questions and things. But, you know, it, it is really about crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And don't work off of assumptions, get the right people involved. Uh, and for state and local issues, that would definitely be my friend Ken. Um, if you have other questions, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, why don't you go ahead and see uh, if there are any questions there? Yeah, definitely. We do have an earlier uh, question that came in early on. Um, somebody asking if there is a luxury tax in Florida, and if so, does this affect new homeowners? No, I mean, there's no luxury tax in Florida. So again, when I, one of the earlier slides talked about inheritance, no inheritance tax, no, you know, no, no type of uh, uh, estate tax. There's no luxury tax in Florida. Um, if, if you remember Ken's slide, it was like, no for almost all these different categories of taxes. And when you add all those no's up, it, it, it equals a yes. It's really strange math, <laughs> but it's kind of a no brainer when you, when you really start working through it. So uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, go ahead. No, I think that answers it. Um, there's a question in Teague, maybe this relates to what you were just saying about your cost basis, but in co-ops, can capital assessments be applied to your cost basis relative to the amount of shares you own? Uh, co-ops, I believe, are more popular in New York than they are here right. in Florida. Um, you know, the, the best answer is that's a very specific uh, question and a specific issue. I, I don't think it would be advisable to try to shoot that one off the cuff. I think it would probably depend on what the nature of the uh, assessment is. In other words, is it for a capital improvement to the property? And if so, I, I just shooting from the cuff, if I were to do so, I would say if, it's, if, it's, uh, if the nature of the assessment is for a capital improvement, then you would probably see some sort of basis adjustment there. But if it was for something else other than uh, capital improvements or, 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 or something, you know, that, that's not uh, related to improving the property, I, I, I think it, you know, you may get a different answer. And, and again, that's completely off the cuff. I, you know, talking about co-ops is a very uh, uh, neat area and certainly one that, you know, I'm not versed in. But, you know, those are all answers that uh, someone would research and, and that's, they should definitely talk to their tax professional.
Yeah, take it with the pen because, you know, if it's common area stuff, generally not. But if it's stuff for the structure of your unit and reinforcing the walls and stuff like that, then perhaps. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree with that. You know, just without without doing the homework and doing the research, that, that would probably be my answer as well. Perfect. We have a question about the, the prices of the project. So uh, right now we are starting our lower level units are starting at 2.2 million up to the penthouse units at 2.5 million. These are finished units. So the flooring, everything uh, is included besides personal touches like uh, window shades and things like that. And keep in mind, this is our first level tier one family and friend pricing. Uh, we haven't increased, our, done our first bump up in prices yet, but we will be doing so in about two weeks. So these are our bottom line prices. Uh, so it's a great time to buy over the next couple of weeks. So again, 2.2 to 2.5 and our expected delivery is about 14 months away, the end of quarter two, 2022. Um, gentlemen, with that being said, I think we are basically running out of time. Uh, I'm sure there's a ton to talk about. Uh, Ken and Teague, do you guys have a, a slide or where can people contact you with more questions and to get in touch with you uh, for more tax related questions? I put it up there, but again, we'll, we'll, we'll circulate the slide deck and as you may have specific questions specific to your circumstance, again, Teague and I will be happy to discuss it with you or discuss it with your current accountant as well. Right, and, and I'm going to, I'm also going to, uh, uh, shamelessly, uh, my, my wife is also a real estate transactional attorney and uh, that's all she does. So if there are questions uh, in, that, in that area as well, uh, you know, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to help you. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a great project and we have a, a great development team. Uh, the, the, you know, the project has just been top to bottom scrutinized and every detail has been scrutinized and, and we, we're really proud of what we're doing here. Great. Uh, Ken, one last question. Um, somebody's asking within their marketing materials, can they pass along your information to their clients or to their buyers um, if they have further questions? Yeah, that should, um, I don't have a problem with that. So, sure. All right. all right, everyone. So you have all the contact information on the screen. For more information on 160 Marina Bay, you can go to 160marinabay.com or you can call us here at the sales center. We're located right on Las Olas Boulevard at 954 nine three nine zero four four zero and you can also send me a direct email at jordan at 160 marina bay um, so what did we learn today we learned that you should definitely move to florida uh, save some money on taxes enjoy our quality of life under the sunshine and on the beach and under the palm trees and definitely buy a unit at 160 marina bay uh, so ken and teague i really appreciate your time and to all our attendees thank you so much for joining it was a pleasure having everyone Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for Gordon. the opportunity. Thank you, Ken. Really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Have a good one. All right.